What's up and welcome to Elevate City Nights Online. Hey, if you're new to Elevate City, my name is Joey McLaughlin and I am so pumped that you're tuning in from wherever you are. Hey, do me a big favor real quick. Like, comment on, share this stream and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you and your friends can get the most up-to-date Elevate City content. If you are new, Elevate City is a brand new, Jesus-centered, discipleship-driven, transformation-focused church. We live for life change, and we are launching in the Sandy Springs perimeter area just outside of Atlanta in August 2020. Now, that's where you make some noise in your living room. Give a little fist bump to someone you're watching at home with. Drop some love in the comment section, because In light of everything going on in our world with the coronavirus, it would be so easy to just pack up shop, to take our ball and go home. It'd be so easy to call this thing quits. But if you spend two minutes with us, you'll know that's not the kind of church that we are. We see adversity as an opportunity. We aren't shrinking back. We're stepping up. We aren't holding our ground. We're taking new ground for the fame of Jesus and for the sake of a generation, amen? Amen. All right, transparent moment. Any of y'all ever write vent letters? Like someone gets under your skin and you write them a letter, you put it in the mail and you send it to yourself. Y'all ever do that? It's because like you love Jesus, but you don't wanna stoop to their level, but somebody needs to hear about it. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I, I wrote a little vent letter on Instagram the first time someone asked me what this would mean for Elevate City. They were like, are y'all even doing Elevate City with the coronavirus? Like, is anybody even gonna wanna come? Um, If y'all are okay with it, I just wanna read this vent letter that I wrote. Like, is this a safe place? Is this like a judgment-free zone? We're about to find out. All right, this is what I wrote. Y'all ready for this? Dear enemy, (laughs) not that the person is the enemy, but you know, get behind me, Satan. (laughs) Dear enemy, here are my thoughts on COVID-19. This planned setback is really just a setup for us to come back even stronger. Check Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, setback, but God intended it for good, set up. To accomplish what is now being done, come back. The saving of many lives. I know how this story ends. Jesus always wins. Sincerely, the rising up church of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. I believe that curiosity about eternity is on the rise. I believe that being trapped in isolation is making people desperate for connection. That the nonstop stories and statistics that have been rolling across the screens of death and destruction are getting ready to be replaced by nonstop stories of lives that Jesus is saving. I believe in the potential of this being the greatest altar call our generation has ever seen. The message that I wanna preach for you today comes from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter three, verse 15. This is what it says. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The message that I wanna preach for you today couldn't be more timely. It couldn't be more connected to what we're experiencing right now in our world. Confession. I wanna let y'all know that I've caught it. I think I've contracted it. I don't know who I got it from or where I picked it up or who I might've spread it to, but I think this virus has taken me victim to. No, I'm not talking about the coronavirus. I'm talking about the complacency virus. I wanna preach a message for you today that I'm praying wakes a generation titled the complacency virus. Have you caught it? This pandemic of passivity, this epidemic of apathy that plagues Christians and kills churches. 
You know, as I've been prepping to launch Elevate City, I've done so much research and I've researched church statistics and trends and so much talk is given to um, church attendance plateauing or declining. And I think the reason that church attendance is plateauing or declining is because a lot of Christians have plateaued or are declining. Is your relationship with God on life support today? Like, how's your spiritual health? I I don't know about you, but the further and the deeper that we've gotten into this pandemic, the more clear the parallels have become between the effects this virus physically has and the effects of the complacency virus spiritually. Yo, is anyone tired of sheltering in place? Let me hear every mom that misses Target say, yeah, yeah. I think I heard some of y'all through the camera. We're a month into this thing and we're already tired, sick and tired and wanna break out of the prisons that our houses feel like they've become. Like the only walks that I used to take y'all was like walks to the pantry, okay? Like that's the only walks I used to take. But now I walk because I wanna get out and stop sheltering in. Hey, you know what's funny? is that it only took a month for us to grow so tired of sheltering in place physically when many of us have been sheltering in the exact same place in our relationship with God for as long as we can remember. I wanna ask you a question and I want you to really take a second and think about it. Maybe jot it down if you're taking notes. When is the last time that you experienced real genuine growth? real undeniable breakthrough, like movement, progress, transformation in your relationship with God, where you didn't just listen to sermons, but you lived sermons, where God's word gripped you to the point that you actually changed things in your life, where obedience felt unshakable, where you felt like you were getting stronger and bolder and more passionate, where you were becoming more convinced of the claims of Jesus and more concerned about the kingdom of God. When time in his presence was increasing and sin was decreasing, where you wanted his word like you wanted another episode of Tiger King. You feel me? I think if there was a test for the complacency virus, that the statistics would be staggering. Are you stuck, stagnated, sheltering in a place of growthless, lifeless Christianity? Because you don't have to be. You, you know, it's a lot of fun when you're a kid, the kiddie pool. Like when you're a kid, the kiddie pool is a blast. You're rocking your arm floaties, your flamingo inner tube. You got your snorkel, what up, right? It's so much fun when you're a little kid. Do you know what is um, really awkward when you're not a kid? The kiddie pool. Do you know what you do if you see like a grown man with hair on his chest, just splashing around in the kiddie pool, having the time of his life? You call the cops, Like, that's just weird, bro. Like, as you get older, you can't stay in the same place. And way too many of us have been sheltering in the same place in our relationship with God because we caught the complacency virus. It's wreaking havoc on the health of Christians. It's wreaking havoc on the movement of Jesus and on the economy of heaven. You know, one of the things that I have hated the most about this virus is social distancing. Like I've straight up just being real, I've been tempted to just like hug some strangers. Okay. Like, I don't know if I, I don't know if you feel this way or not. Okay. But like, I've, I've literally been tempted to be like, I don't know if you have it. I don't know if I have it, but here's a hug. Good luck. Holla. Right. Anybody with me? My wife told me, no, probably not. Nobody's with me, but I miss people. Don't get me wrong. I know social distancing saves lives, but social distancing still sucks. Can I say that? <laughs> Someone should make that a t-shirt. Saves lives, still, still sucks. I am so sick of social distancing. But don't you know that there are some Christians who've been social distancing for years? Uh-oh, staying in our holy huddles, more concerned with protecting ourselves than caring for those who are spiritually sick which is so funny because I remember Jesus saying that it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. He has not come to call the righteous, 
dressed in white, but the sinners unto repentance. Like, you know, you know some hazmat suit kind of Christians. Like, where's my hazmat suit at, y'all? Y'all had no idea I was about to take this illustration this far, did you? You had no idea that I was gonna bring a hazmat suit into this sermon. But this is where we're living at, y'all. I'm committed to this analogy. Hazmat suits, you know that you know some hazmat suits kind of Christians. Some people who are dressed up, Jay's in the way, sorry, gotta get him on, Jay's in the way, here we go. Hazmat suit kind of Christians. Y'all seen Christians rocking these, right? Like they got saved and they put on this suit of self-righteousness that insulates them from the outside world. They are as white as snow on the outside, but probably whitewashed tombs on the inside. They're so concerned with dressing up in this perfect religious persona, they go out in public, but they keep their distance from those they think are diseased. They make decisions that keep any blemishes from getting on their spotless, clean Christianity. They can't associate with certain types of people or befriend certain types of people. They keep their distance. They wear this odd suit with the intention of protection, not realizing that it produces fear. Listen, don't get me wrong, health professionals, protect yourself, okay? Wear your hazmat suits and stay safe. But can we all agree that we get just like a little bit nervous when we see you wearing them? (laughs) I'm like, what kind of sci-fi movie am I living in right now? E.T., phone home, am I right? Like, we project this weird sense of misguided morality that makes the world nervous to be around us. You know, there's not just hazmat suit kind of Christians. There are some Christians who've been wearing masks too. So many masks, if we're being honest, but that's another sermon for another day. Particularly these masks, the masks that you're seeing people wear all of the time. Christians wear masks just like this. And it's interesting how many parallels there are to me. With the coronavirus, we wear these masks to keep things from coming out of our mouth that would spread the disease. With the complacency virus, we put on masks that keep us from spreading the cure. Has the virus of complacency kept your mouth from spreading the love of Jesus? When is the last time you opened your mouth and someone caught Jesus from you? Could you imagine if we were half as concerned with the spread of Christianity as we are with the spread of this virus? Like, what would that do? How would that shape? How would that change things? One of my best friends was telling me that his mother-in-law has been totally freaked out by all of this. The coronavirus just, man, it's got her stressed. She's been taking all the precautions, hand sanitizer, wearing the mask everywhere, extreme social distancing, like crazy. And he asked her, hey, what's going on? Like, why are you so intense? And she says, I'm 60 plus years old. Like if I get it, I go into a hospital. If it gets bad, I'm isolated in that hospital, apart from my husband, apart from my kids, apart from my grandkids, where I might die all alone if I don't social distance. And when he told me that, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, whoa, this is really serious. That's like really intense. But then it almost simultaneously hit me that the same thing happens, but in reverse in the life of Christians. Like if we continue to socially distance in the spiritual sense, without us spreading the gospel that we carry to people all over the planet, millions are going to die all alone without Jesus by their side. Like when this thing is over, when the coronavirus is gone and it's safe to go back out and interact with people, we can't keep wearing these suits. We can't continue to keep our distance when there's a lost and broken world who is dying without Jesus. I think it's time to take off the masks. I think it's time to step out of the suits and believe that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. To have faith, that is bigger than fear, to value the mission over our own protection and self-preservation. I think it's time that we step out of these suits to care more about people getting rescued than what we might risk. As followers of Jesus, we don't isolate, 
We associate. We don't socially distance. We spiritually pursue the world. Man, they're gonna be waiting for, for answers and they're gonna be looking for hope. Let's take our cues from Jesus who didn't distance himself, but who moved into the neighborhood, who put on a skin suit to look just like us and demonstrate how much he loves us. Come on, somebody. It's funny to think about how we used to think about immune systems, isn't it? Like before the virus, like as a kid, you would eat like a Fred Flintstone vitamin and you're set, am I right? Like y'all remember those days? Like before Rona, it's like you eat one of those ICI bowls or whatever they're called and you're wearing antibody armor all day long. Now it's like we're doing everything we can to strengthen our immune systems. My wife, y'all, this girl got my body pumped full of so many voodoo witch doctor medicines that I think I'm secretly getting poisoned, okay? It's like four vitamin C emergency packs a day. She's feeding me cod liver oil, thieves oil from like the black plague. The other day, she wanted me to snort something that was like put out in a line that was purple. I was like, if I put that in my body, I'm gonna definitely die. (laughs) What we've realized is how a weakened immune system can make us susceptible to this virus. Have you realized that most of us have such a weakened spiritual immune system that just about anything can take us out? A bad day, a sliver of doubt, something not going our way, God not coming through on a promise that he never actually made us, a virus, you name it, and we're taken out. We abandon the faith. We walk out on God. We throw our fist up in anger and shake it in his face. The thing that I love so much about the scripture that we started with tonight is that it's a call to be strengthened. And I believe that it's time for the church of Jesus to be strengthened, for an immunity to apathy to be developed. You know, a scared world needs a fearless church and a weakened world needs a strong church. The apostle Paul says, he says, I bow my knees and pray to the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. This virus is a global issue, but this global issue means there's a global opportunity. There's an awakening that can happen, not just for a church, but for the church of Jesus Christ. Like one thing that I felt in this pandemic is that we're all in this together. Like this virus has just leveled the playing field. No one is immune. Everyone is at risk. Christians, can we all be in this thing together again? Can the walls of division fall? Can we eradicate complacency? Can we wake up to our destiny of bringing heaven to earth? No territorial division, but one shared mission of waking the world up to the wonder of Jesus once again. Hear me say this, unity is the infancy of revival. Nothing can stand against a unified church. Can we plant seeds of revival by putting our differences aside to step into a harvest that is right in front of us, that is so plentiful, but that has laborers that are so few? Paul goes on to ask that according to the riches of God's grace, that we would be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being. Listen, if you're hearing this tonight and you're like, yeah, that's me, Joey. You are straight reading my mail tonight. I've caught the complacency virus. Like I feel so convicted about where I've let my faith get to and what I've let my faith become. I feel sick to my stomach right now. Like I want this so badly, but I feel so stuck. And I don't know that I have it in me to pull myself out of this thing, to shake the dust off of my soul. Well, I've got good news for you tonight. My God's ability is in no short supply. What you need, he's got in stock. He's got the mark cornered, market cornered on miracles and he is rich in revival. But this revival needs to happen in you before it can ever happen through you. It's something that happens in your, in your inner being before it passes to other people. Don't miss this tonight. The only cure for complacency is a radical awakening to the love of Jesus Christ. Have you forgotten your first love? This is the heartbeat of Paul's prayer. 
love. Look at what he says. He says that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength together with all of the saints to understand the height and the depth and the breadth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Can I remind you today how radically Jesus loves you? How illogically he loves you. It's beyond what you can comprehend. You can't find this kind of love on the internet. You can't find it in another human being. There is no limit to his love for you. Let me tell you, the breadth of Jesus's love is that his arms were stretched out on a cross for you. The height of Jesus's love is that he left behind heaven for you. The depth of Jesus's love is that he took on hell for you. And the surpassing knowledge of Jesus's love is that he knows everything about you and he loves you any way. There's no mountain he would not climb. There is no ocean he would not invade. No length he would not go to. He became sin for you. Lay down his life for you. He's come so close. He cares so much. We need to rediscover the love of Jesus that feels wild and illogical and like an ocean that you're falling deeper and deeper into where your regrets and your fears and your mistakes are swallowed up in the goodness of God, where an hour in his presence feels like a minute that just flew by, where grace feels like this insane gift that you don't deserve and not some religious right. You know, if there has been any benefit to this virus, it's undoubtedly the time that I've gotten with my little girl that I would have never otherwise had. Y'all, the other day we were playing the Little Mermaid and she was Ursula and I was Ariel and uh, she took my voice because Ursula takes Ariel's voice. And guys, for an hour, I pretended like I didn't have a voice. She started calling Kayla. She was like, mom, we've got a big problem down here. Mom, dad can't talk. Y'all, I'm scarring my child in this time. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? But here's what I've realized is that my concern for this little girl is so unbelievably great. There is nothing I don't care about in her life. Like I love, I love it when she wakes up in the morning and I just ask her what she dreamed about the night before. Like it usually involves like candy and God telling her that she was gonna become a pizza maker. Y'all pray for me, like Lord help me. But I love, I love watching her play. Like I just stand there and just like watch her as she's playing in her playroom. I'm just like eavesdropping on her talking to her Barbies. (laughs) I'm like stalkerishly listening as she's talking to herself. Like she's watching TV y'all and I'm just watching her, just gazing into her big brown eyes. And the other day we were uh, were playing Rescue the Princess where I was the handsome prince, naturally. And um, she was the damsel in distress. She was the princess who needed to be rescued from this fiery castle, right? Um, AKA the playground. And when it was all said and done, I, I pick her up and I say to her, I'm so glad that you're my little princess. And she lays her head on my shoulder and she says, I'm so glad you're my daddy. And man, it's just been hitting me in waves this season, as I've been holding my baby girl, probably crying like a baby myself, that God, this is how you feel about me? This is how you love me? You watch my every move. You freak out when I do anything. You see me take a step and you lose your mind. I'm watching who knows what on Netflix and you're just watching me? And in this imperfect backwards analogy, I realized that for so long, I've been so busy with life and he's just been wanting to spend life with me. We need to get reacquainted with this kind of radical love, revival love, wake your soul up kind of love. We so desperately, so desperately want this world that we're living in right now to change. Is it possible 
that God desperately wants us to change? Let me just ask, was life really working before? What is it that you so badly want to get back to? Like, let me, just, let me just ask, was your marriage working? Was that job really working? Was that college degree that you spent $100 billion on working? Was it working for you or were you just working to pay it off? Was your soul working or were you just sleepwalking or shall I say scrolling through life? Hey, honestly, was church working? I'm just asking, maybe it was, I don't know, but was your relationship with God, was it working? Or had you caught the complacency virus? Let me just honestly ask if it's possible that the scariest pandemic of our generation could also be what God uses to produce the greatest revival of our generation. You know, just like with the coronavirus, you can catch it and be asymptomatic. You can catch the complacency virus and be asymptomatic as well. You can stagnate and not see the signs. You can have it and not even know it. And I wonder if hidden within all of this is this great grace of God to shake us free from our routines of religion and from the motions we've gotten caught up in to rediscover his insane love for us. I wonder if God might be saying the same thing to us that he said in Isaiah 29 and that Jesus quoted in Matthew 15, where he says, these people, they come near to me with their mouths and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based only on rules that have been taught by men. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. I think it's time for wonder upon wonder. I think it's time for revival. I think it's time we embrace diametric changes as the people of God and as the church of Jesus. And I don't even know what it looks like quite yet to be completely honest. But I do know that the church has left the building and that we can't come back the same. Something's got to go. Something's got to give. Something's got to change. We don't need to get back. We need to move forward. I don't know about you, but I am tired of normal. I want supernatural. I don't want life in my own strength. I want the same power that raised Jesus from the grave to be alive in me. I want the church of Jesus to lead the way forward in this new world. I wanna see faith rise up and complacency eradicate. I wanna see movement overtake apathy and for the greatness of God to fall afresh again. I wanna see a revival. I wanna close out our first Elevate City Nights online by praying a prayer that I've been praying from the book of Psalms. And I wanna pray this prayer until we meet back together again in person. I've been praying this nonstop. Like, and I'm gonna ask you to begin to pray this Psalm with me, to begin to read this Psalm every day until we gather together again, to let this become our anthem, to let this become the cry of our hearts. I'm, I'm gonna have this thing memorized when it's all said and done. I might get this junk tatted on my body, who knows, all right? All I know is that God is tattooing revival on my heart and I pray he puts it on yours too. Psalm 85, if you have your Bible, go ahead and get there. Psalm 85. I wanna read this Psalm over us as a prayer for revival. Lord, you poured out blessings on your land. You restored the fortunes of Israel. You forgave the guilt of your people. Yes, you covered all their sins. You held back your fury. You kept back your blazing anger. Now restore us again. O oh God of our salvation, put aside your anger against us once more. Will you be angry with us always? Will you prolong your wrath to all generations? Won't you revive us again so that your people can rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O oh Lord, and grant us your salvation. I listen carefully to what God the Lord is saying. 
for he speaks peace to his faithful people. But let them not return to their foolish ways. We can't go back to normal. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. So our land will be filled with his glory. Unfailing love and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth springs up from the earth and righteousness smiles down from heaven. Yes, the Lord pours down his blessings. Our land will yield its bountiful harvest. Righteousness goes as a herald before him, preparing the way for his steps. Lord, send revival. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would use this night. I pray that you would use these moments that we share together to awaken us from our apathy. God, I pray for those of us who have caught this complacency virus, who have been so stuck in a relationship with you that has not grown and that has not matured and that has not advanced, that tonight we would feel the love of Jesus waking something within us. God, that we would feel all over again that you really love us, that you're crazy about us. And that in the midst of all our hurry and busyness and scattering, that what you want is us in your presence, seeking your face, knowing your goodness. God, I pray that you would send revival and I pray that it would start with us. God, I pray that it would start with me. God, make me fully surrender to your will and to your way for my life. God, give me this holy passion. Give me this clear vision that is unshakable. Jesus, rid us of this complacency and grant us revival. We ask it in your beautiful name. And all God's people said, amen.